Welcome to Lecture 4.2, Z-Scores, Hypothesis Testing, and uh, Sampling Distributions. All right. So how can we apply hypothesis testing to Z-Scores? Let's imagine a question, are vegans smarter or slower than normal? So imagine we have um, data on a standard IQ test. And on this test, we know that normal people score 100 with the standard deviation of 15. So if we were to represent that graphically, you would have um, the distribution here where you have 100 um, in the center and then 115 and 130. So uh, the mu of 100 and standard deviation of 15. So we would have both the null and the alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis, which we'd like to disprove, would be that uh, vegans come from the normal population. And the alternative would be that uh, vegans come from an al So for our hypotheses, the null is that mu is equal to 100, which would mean that vegans come from the normal population. And the alternative would be that mu is not equal to 100, meaning that vegans come from some alternative population that has a different mean. So maybe they're smarter, for example. OK. so. Let's assume that Vernie the vegan scored 135. So um, there's a score of 135. And what we want to determine is where that falls in the distribution here. How extreme is that score of 135? So we're going to take our information here. Um, 100 is the um, the mean, 15 is the standard deviation, and then the score is 135. So that would give us uh, the following z-score calculation. We plug in the score, the mean, and the standard deviation, and that gives us a z-score of 2.3 repeating. So here it comes. Woo! So that's the z of 2.333. So in other words, See how it lines up with about 135 here in terms of the raw score? We've just converted it to a z-score so we can put it on this normal curve and de decide what percent fall above or below it if we need to. So the crucial question at this point is, where does this score come from? Does it come from the, the null distribution or from the alternative distribution? So like we said, the critical question is, where does Bernie's score come from? Remember, the null is saying that he's not smarter than normal, that he comes from this normal distribution where mu is equal to 100. So this is the normal distribution, what we'd expect from typical people on IQ. The alternative is that he's smarter than normal. Actually, it could be that he's dumber than normal, but since the score is on the right-hand side, we're going to assume that he's probably smarter, if anything. So here I'm just positing, I'm just suggesting that there might be an, a different distribution that his score comes from. This would be one of the alternatives that are possible. And in this case, if I were to say that his score came from this distribution or this population, that would be the same as saying he's smarter than normal people. So what we're trying to do is make the decision, do we reject or retain the null hypothesis? We should bear in mind that there are a number of alternative uh, distributions. And so I could have as many colors here as you'd like going both to the left and to the right. Um, in other words, we don't know what mu is for vegans. It could be higher, it could be lower. And here I'm just showing you three possibilities that a given uh, score like this 2.3 could come from. So key point is there's only one null distribution, but there's an infinite number of alternative distributions. Um, only God knows exactly what the mu is for vegans. We have to make a guess. So critical question, how to decide which it's from? In other words, can we set a cutoff, or what can we do to make this decision? How do we know, that is, when to reject or when to retain? So again, we have that z-score of 2.33. And remember, that's how smart our vegan was. That's how smart, what's his name again? Vernie? OK, so what we do is establish a cutoff. And typically we say, well, if there's only a 5% chance of being wrong, we'll go ahead and reject the null hypothesis. 
I'm going to show you now how we represent that on the graph down here. We take that 5% and divide it in 2, and that's 2.5%, because we want to be able to check for extreme scores on both the high end, the positive end, and on the negative end. And we'll establish a z-critical for a proportion of area equal to 0.025 of the curve. So if you go to your z-score table and you look up in the area beyond 0.025, you will find a z-score of 1.96. So we would establish um, this cutoff. If the z obtained, if this z-score down here that we got is equal to or greater than 1.96, we'll reject the null hypothesis and say that vegans are smarter than average. If the z obtained is less than or equal to 1.96, in other words, it's inside um, of these cutoffs, then we're going to retain the null and say that vegans aren't any different in terms of intelligence. So let's locate those z-scores graphically. Here's that 1.96 positive and here's that 1.96 negative. And you can see I've shaded in the area that we'll call the region of rejection. And if the z obtained falls in that region of rejection, then we can do, uh, then we can reject the null hypothesis. So in this case, what can we do? Reject or retain? That's right, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. In other words, we're going to conclude that vegans are smarter than normal. And just to recap, that's because our z obtained score was extreme enough that we assume it's coming from some alternative distribution. And I'll just... Uh, so in other words, there's an alternative distribution here that we think this z obtained comes from. It comes from a distribution where vegans are smarter than normal. It does not come from the null distribution that we have here. Okay, next topic is z-scores with sampling distributions. So, so far we've covered distributions and that's where we have a distribution of scores. In other words, just x's. Um, so like your SAT score would be um, a score and you could compare it to the mu of 500 if you wanted to get a z-score for it. Sampling distributions instead have um, a distribution of sample means. So in other words, it's x with the bar over it. And we're going to have a mean then that we're looking at. So like the mean for, say, four psychology majors, and we'd compare that to the mu. So we're going to have two different kinds of z-scores. And the key point here is that there's going to be differences in variability. So here's a, a way to think about that. If you're determining the travel time to Charleston, should you ask one or five people? Is the score or the sample mean going to be more accurate? Well, I think most of us would assume that if we asked five people and got the average of that, that we're going to be better off. So the rule of thumb, again, is that we've, um, which we've learned before, as the variability goes down, prediction accuracy is going to go up. And another way of saying that is sample means we're always going to have less variability relative to their scores. We'd always be more accurate getting a mean of how long it takes to get to Charleston based on the answers of five people than just an individual score. So if that's a little fuzzy, that's okay. We're going to flesh it out here momentarily. Okay, why use sampling distributions? Well, they're more accurate. That's what I was just saying with the Charleston example. So let's imagine we have a population of SAT scores where the mu is 500, that's normal, and we take people out one at a time. So we'd get, in that case, a distribution of scores, what we call a frequency distribution. So you would have, uh, for example, 500, 450, 600, 525, 675. There's a good bit of variability in these scores, right? Because they're just individual scores. They're just one at a time. If instead we take people out four at a time, so four at a time, you're going to see the sampling distribution based on sample means. So here I have the means of 530, 480, 540, 510, 490, etc. So compare these to these up here. 
which have less variability. And you can pause and think about it if you'd like. Okay, you should have answered that the sampling distribution, the sample means, have less variability. These numbers are closer together than the scores. So, because there's differences in variability, in one case, we need to use standard deviation, which we've been using so far. And in the other case, we'll need to use this new statistic called standard error. So if you'll notice, the difference is the x has a bar over it. That's the difference. Here we're looking at the variability of x's. Here it's the variability of x bar. So again, which is always smaller? It's always the standard error that's smaller. And the key point that we're getting to is that you're going to have to have different z-score formulas. Okay, so what do the formulas look like? If you have a sampling distribution, just an individual score, like your score on the SAT, you would have z is equal to x minus mu divided by standard deviation. The sampling distribution z-score is different. So you can see here we have the x-bar and the x-bar um, next to the sigma. So this is the sample mean and this is standard error. So we typically don't know that and we need to calculate it. So here I'm giving you the formula and I'll define standard error the mean for you. It's the typical deviation of sample means around population mean. Or another way of saying it is the measure of the variability in a sampling distribution. Okay, and I've included here a chart that summarizes the differences and I'll let you um, look at that on your own time. And now we're going to work through a comparison of the um, two kinds of z-scores. So first we'll do the frequency distribution of z-scores. So again we're starting with um, just scores and we're going to assume we're working with a score of 675 on the SAT. And we're going to test if that student is smarter than average. And again, we're going to use that 5% cutoff, and you'll recall that we got z-critical values based on that 5% of 1.96. Okay, so we have a frequency distribution where we're going to have a distribution of scores. So you can see here we have uh, the score of 675. And you will have uh, the formula that you've seen before, x minus mu divided by standard deviation, and that'll work out to a score of 1.75. Okay. So, in this case, can we reject the null hypothesis? No. Our z obtained, the 1.75, is simply not large enough to reject. It's not more extreme than that 1.96 cutoff. And you'll note here, just to uh, emphasize, that we're dealing with scores. That's why you see these X's uh, with the green arrows. All right, All right. so now we're going to um, do a comparison and look at a sampling distribution. Um, again, the key difference will be that we have uh, a distribution of sample means. So in this case, let's imagine that we have four psych students and we have their average of 675 on the SAT, and we want to test whether this group is different than average, whether that mean is different than normal. And again, we'll use the 5% um, cutoff. Okay, so we can uh, imagine our sampling distribution, uh, where variability is measured in terms of standard error, and we're going to have our z-score formula, uh, uh, which is going to be slightly different. We're going to first need to calculate standard error, so we take our standard deviation, plug that in, and divide by the square root of the number of subjects we have, which is 4, and that'll get us the score of, excuse me, the sample, that, it'll get us the, and that will give us the standard error of the mean. So this number represents the amount of variability that we're going to expect in sample means, just based on sampling error. All right, and then we will calculate the z-score, where you plug in the sample mean, you plug in 
the um, population mean and plug in standard error, which we just calculated. And now we get a z-score of 3.5. So again, note the difference that we are dealing with sample means here in each of these three places. Okay, so because z obtained is greater than z critical, remember our z obtained is going to be uh, this value in the z critical is that 1.96 cutoff. We can reject the null hypothesis and say that these psychology students are smarter than average. All right, the last thing is I want to review with you how you would graph these two distributions. So first of all, if you're graphing a frequency distribution, let's work with the same example. You got a mean of 500, population mean of 500, and a standard deviation of 100. Well, if it's just scores that you're graphing, then we're dealing with standard deviation as our measure of variability. And so one standard deviation above 500 would be 600, 2 would be 700, 3 would be 800. So this distance is equal to standard deviation. In contrast, in a sampling distribution, we now have sample means that are making up this distribution here. And so instead of dealing with scores, we're dealing with um, sample means. So if we're taking four at a time, what should um, our standard error equal? Well, if you recall from what we just worked through, it would turn out to be 50. And so we could graph it as 500, 550, 600, 650. And that's how you would graph um, the sampling distribution. And of course, you could go in the other direction as well. So the moral of the story is if it's a sampling distribution where you're dealing with sample means taken four at a time, or six at a time, or 10 at a time, or 100 at a time, you need to use standard error. So this um, difference between 500 and 550 is um, measured in terms of standard error. All right, that concludes this lecture. Thank you.